we can talk about the distillation part. There's two different types of, of stills that are column designs that we, that we want to talk about. We have the kettle we talked about with the image I showed in the picture. And that's your 15% water alcohol mixture approximately is going to be boiling or going to be uh, in there and we will prepare to heat that. And so the vapors are going to rise up through some type of a column to start stripping out the alcohol away from the water. As I said, the, water, the alcohol vaporizes at 173 plus degrees. Water vaporizes at 212. So the alcohol is going to come off as a vapor first. Since we can't really legally have an operating distillery, I've just sort of taken a tube here to show you what we're, what we're doing. It's lightweight, so I don't have to, I didn't bring the metal one because that's, you know, sort of heavy, whatever, just an example. You know, this is basically like a four inch column. This not, you know, there's still sizes for beverage use and people who are making it for that kind of stuff or, or you know, who do make it for that kind of stuff uh, would be using a two inch column, something like that, maybe, maybe a three. For fuel, it's going to be at least a four-inch column. It's going to, six is better, eight is not uncommon, and of course, with some of these designs, a 16-inch, and that's getting into a real, that's a commercial size unit. Why was that small 150-gallon distillery having a 12-inch column? That thing was a huge column on a small still. It's less liquid they have to control through the, through the process, because they, at each level of those four, I think that was one you were talking about, had four steps. Each level has to be very meticulously controlled so it can't over flood and it can't under flood. It has to always be wet. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll show, you, uh, I'll show you how that is. We have a, I have a piece of the still here. Here it is here. Essentially what we have, the, the more effective still, the more, you know, the more efficient still is a bubble plate. There's a piece of glass that goes in here and then there's a clamp like this but smaller that goes around it. So that's, that's your viewport. And then in here, for this size of a still, for this four inch column, there's three downcomers. These are, these are called um, downcomers. There's three of them for, you know, for this size. As you get up into a six inch, there's, there's four of them. And then with the bigger ones, there's more and more. So they have it all engineered. This is actually a fairly new concept and actually being able to buy it at a, at a um, consumer level everything already machined out for you because normally you would have to you'd have to make this you have to take your you can buy the little caps but you'd have to take a saw and cut cut the little slots you can pass that around it's locked it's locked up essentially what happens is the down is the downcomer is on the bottom part and the the bubble cap is on the top part and the vapors can rise up through the center of the of the smaller tube it hits the top of this thing and the gases hit the top of that and the only way out is through these slotted openings here. This is flooded with water within the system because it's all sealed up. Here's a clamp and then you have another another section like this on top so we just stack these up. It could be six, it could be four of them, it could be six of them, it just depends on how you feel you want to design the still. So this is basically flooded with water up to up to that point and the vapors will will rise up and then the uh, the water will you know drop down and build up in the pot, you know, because your still is basically like this. You know, you can imagine the, imagine the uh, top of the still, you have that, you know, you have this. So as, as it goes up through each of these levels, it's one of these, one of these, one of these, it will, it will drive the vapors as they bubble through. It separates the water from the vaporous alcohol. As it passes through the flood in here, it, that's what actually separates makes a separation. And then this, the alcohol vapors go up to the next level and it does it all over again. Meanwhile, any excess water falls down back through this thing down into the lower level, the next level, the next level, till, till it goes back into the tub. It still has some alcohol in it, you know, some alcohol in it. And so it, then it just gets, it gets driven up all over again until we eventually run out of alcohol available in the liquid that's coming up as vapor through the, you know, through the system. So that's, um, it essentially, the best way I can describe it is that the action of the vapor passing through, which the vapor, which is, which is actually a mixture of alcohol and, and some water vapor too, because it is, you know, it is boiling. And you can control what, what the, how strong those vapors are by the temperature of that pot. That's the whole thing. If you turned it up all the way and started boiling it, you're going to get a lot more water because you're going to start, start boiling water. Um, you know, of course, you'll be driving the alcohol up too. But the action of, the, of that vapor passing through 
the flood, the little pool of water that's existing at each stage going on the way up is what separates the alcohol from alcohol vapor from the water vapor. And the water vapor turns in, you know, essentially condenses and, and falls back down. So the, the gases that get up that inner tube looks like they have to go through, because this is probably... Well, this is, see, this is underneath that plate. Yeah, I'm yeah. seeing that. So, but even to get up through that plate, you have to go through these holes, down through, looks like probably a pool of water, yeah. and then, then uh, up that tube into the next chamber. The next thing, it actually circulates, it, it, does, a, it does a circuitous path to really it's get... forcing it through. Yeah, the exactly, yeah. The, That's exactly how it works. That's exactly how it works. It's, 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 a divi it's, a, it's a means of using both the physical passages that we're allowing it to use and the, and the action of going through water that makes it, makes it separate. Those are diverters. So the water, um, we, you can actually, it, it gets bent. I didn't bend it, but it gets bent. And you can actually adjust the direction and angle of where the water dripping down onto the next, onto the really? next step. Yeah. yeah, that's what they are, little stainless steel diverters. Fancy. Yeah, yeah this, these, this is an expensive way to go. I mean, you can make, if you're, if you're into metalworking and you, know, you weld and stuff, uh, TIG welding or MIG welding, um, you can, uh, you know, you can make this. Available online? Yeah, it's available online, yeah. This is, this is actually a purchase piece. And, you know, it's made for, made for fuel people, for beverage people, whatever. Still Dragon? It's called Still Dragon, yeah. That's the name of the company. Still Dragon. It's in Florida. Let's go outside and just finish this pitching, and then, uh, and then we can come back in, and, and we'll be in here for the rest of the class. Okay, we've got, uh, we've used the chiller to bring the temperature down to about 90. Actually, I checked it before. It was just about 95, and I'll check it again now. It'll probably be a little bit cooler now. This will be about 93 degrees, which is fine. We're in an, an environment where the yeast will not be scalded. So we take the chiller out, and you can see it's all messy, but we'll just have to live with that. And we will sterilize this again, because I'm going to stick it in the water at a lower than boiling temperature. I really only let the bottom touch anything, but you know, it's, it's better safe than sorry. Now I'm just gonna basically stir this up a little bit, make sure we don't have any clumps. And by this time it's, it's gelatinized um, and gone through its you know, conversion. This, this particular conversion isn't really um, one of the better ones. I'll be, you know, be honest with you, it's not, it hasn't done as well as it could have, but it's still, you know, it's still functional. You sort of tell by the consistency of it but you know it, it read good on the um, we took a specific reading a specific gravity reading so it had it had content in there we measured out the yeast uh, to the proper to the proper level for the for this amount of water which was five gallons I think or I think we started out with four and a half but I added a little more to cool too and uh, you know we could you could culture this like we did with the wine with the wine uh, yeast uh, the apple juice um, I'm not going to do that just you know save some time we already did it once we don't need to do it twice mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, so what I'm going to do is stir it in here, and it'll, it'll activate on its own. I mean, it's not, it's warm enough. It's at the high end of warm, so what I want to do is, you know, make sure we got a good, you know, a really good um, mix in it. And basically, depending on the yeast you use, I mean, as, this is a turbo yeast. There may be another brand of somebody else's turbo yeast, another manufacturer, or... If we used a we used a um, a wine yeast in here, which will tolerate a higher a higher alcohol content, depending on the type of yeast you use, uh, and you can get the information from the manufacturer. Um, and if you really get into it, you can you look online, and there'll be discussion forums, and you know people talking about making fuel and what yeast they use and that kind of thing. But um, the temperature at which we're going to let this ferment is going to you know be a little different. I mean, it's uh, some of it may be you know, uh, 75 degrees, some of it might be 68. It just depends on what the yeast is. But essentially, we're going to be fermenting it at a period of about seven days or so, maybe 10 days, in a closed container. I'm pretty happy with that right now. In a closed container, so we're just going to, I'm just going to put that right on there. And that's going to keep, at this point, we're, you know, if, if I was, if this was our little shop where we were doing this, I would, I would have the, uh, I would have the uh, lid ready with the with the bubbler, and we'd be able to to um, just let it burp out. It'll be 
it'll be about, uh, as I said, about 15, well, it could be anywhere 10, 15 hours before it'll start bubbling. But at that point, it's gonna start, it's gonna start consuming, the yeast is gonna start consuming the sugars in there. And then they're gonna start producing carbon dioxide and, uh, and alcohol. And that's when the bubbling is gonna start from the bubbler, which I showed you inside. Um, so at this point, we just, you know, we're just gonna let that sit because we are, we are at the point where, you know, we're, can't do any more, th any more for about seven to 10 days or so. Sometimes it works a little faster. It really just depends on the, what your, what your feedstock is and what, your, um, and what your yeast is like and the temperatures at which you do it. So you can go back in. This is just a bigger version of what, we, what I just showed you over there. So at each of these levels, you can see these tubes coming out the side. Those are like basically flood control gates. So you can flood, you can flood basically flood those plates and, um, and change the, you know, the vaporization rate, or you can let them come down, um, you know, let the level come down a little bit and make a change. It really just depends on, you know, what your temperature is in the, in the kettle, uh, in, in the kettle here to, and, and the vapor temperatures. So um, that's just a mechanism that will allow excess water to come. If it's flooding more than will drop down through the internal uh, drains, it's, you're going to have to let it, let it come down through the, by your own, you know, by your own control. So as I said, they're, they're both manually controlled and normally uh, c computer controlled. So they, you know, they, uh, um, you know, have a, have a program, a software program of something this size that will read all that and if that valve needs to be opened, it'll drain as, as it needs to and then shut it. Um, but if you're, a, if you're a trained operator and you really understand as you're reading the parrot, as I said, the, the floating hydrometer, the operator may make adjustments in here to, you know, get his, his proof up or down. I mean, sometimes you don't really want you know, you may not want for some reason as high a proof. Um, you can run the alcohol, you can run the water just through that thing till the cows come home. The trouble, and until the alcohol level comes up to, you know, where you want it to be. The trouble with that is you're, you're expending a lot more fuel than you probably want to be. And you can get it to 192 proof, say, um, even, in a, even in a moderately decent, you know, not even a great still design, just a, just a moderately good one. But to do that, you're going to have to keep, just keep on recycling that. And it's so much less expensive to make fuel in five hours total to run your batch in five hours than it is in, say, 11, when you just, you know, you're just continually, you're burning all that gas or, or electricity or wood or whatever you're using to fuel it. So, um, you know, generally something this size is, is a, either a gas-fired or an oil-fired steam boiler. It uses low-pressure steam. There's a jacket. This is a double-walled, um, a double-walled um, container, and so the steam gets put in at less than means less than 15 to pounds of pressure. It's usually low, about seven or something like that. And uh, the you know the boiler's over here somewhere, and it's sending it's sending a low-pressure steam through you know through these pipes to heat that container, and that container then heats the water very effectively, very very efficiently. And it's called a bain marie, a, a Mary's bath. It's called, I guess, from winemaking. I, from what I understand, it was actually Mary was. There was another name then, but uh, she was Moses' sister. <laughs> That's how far back this goes. So she, she developed that design. There's, there's a, she wouldn't be scorching the, the liquid inside because you have that double wall. You know, you can cook on the outside without actually scorching the inside. So that design's called a bain marie in French. You know, I just wanted to show you the relationship between that, between that plate and that, those downcomers and the bubble caps and, and how they fit into that, into that system. That's the condenser part, which I'll show you as well. Over here, I've got one made up. But, you know, basically, this is a pretty straightforward um, design. You're doing some initial stripping in this, in this column here, and this is the refractory column, which does the, does the final stripping, and then you're condensing it. And, you know, a lot of this stuff is, this is pretty. I mean, it's, you can see through it and, and all that stuff. I mean, it's, it's designed that way, but the, the industrial stills aren't quite that, aren't quite that uh, you know, fancy. That's the mixing vat, which I already showed you. This is, I've sort of gotten away from this. This is Mr. Painter in Pennsylvania who has the dairy farm up there. He uh, uses the rye for the uh, still. His still is an older design. It's, a, it's a, not a, even a stainless steel. It's, it's a mild steel. And he's just, you know, just show, that's his column there. I think it's a 12-inch column. Um, he'd been operating that on and off for a while in the mid-2005, uh, 2000, 2010, you know, in there. I don't know if he does anymore. His son wasn't that interested, and he's getting ready to retire, so I'm not really sure if they are using that. 
that's uh, Mr. Painter's mixing tub. That's, that exactly is what we just did out there. That's apple pulp, just like we have there, except it's not been, it's been uh, dewatered for feedstock. Because what happens is after the um, alcohol is taken out in the feedstock, it's left, that can be fed, the, the pulp that's left from any of this stuff can be fed, mixed in with cattle feed and other animal livestock feed and fed as, uh, it still has protein in it. So, um, you know, they use it. It's worth something. Yeah. It's one of the byproducts. That was a picture of six-row barley on the stalk. That's the inside of a pretty simple homemade heat or a, a cooking vat. There's a, there's a heat, there's a copper, those are copper coils inside there. And very hot water is passed through them and then it heats the mash in the, in the tank. Hard to agitate that with such a huge coil. Well, that, that one is like this. I'll show you how the agitation goes with that. See the inlet and outlet for the pump? You pump it in a very high pressure and it cr creates such a whirlpool that that's the agitation. It goes in, in two inch pipe, out two inch pipe, and that's your stirring. And these are the, these are the what heated- What kind of pump could be pumping mash? I mean, that's it's a, it's a junk, it's a junk uh, mud puppy, you know, like a, uh, they make pumps that can handle trash. They call them trash pumps. Mm -hmm. It's a high volume, high speed. High heat? Uh, high heat, uh, high volume. Well, can take Oh, it can take heat too, sure. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, it can take heat. All that, all that is factored in. It's, uh, you have to be sure that if you're actually going to be doing this, you would have to specify all that. But yes, these pumps are designed. They're, they're not gear pumps like a traditional pump where stuff would get caught in there and make it damage it. it they're, they use a different type of a design inside so it can pass uh, sand and chunks of stuff. You know, not, I don't mean like pieces of you know, like marbles and stuff, but it'll, it'll, do, it'll do what we have to do here. This is another 150 gallon open top mash tun. As I said, these whiskey guys down there in South Carolina where, where I got these photos where we took the pictures and everything, use open top distillation. That's Mr. Painter's uh, fermentation vats. So what we're doing now, now that I've covered that up and we're in our fermentation stage, that's what he's got here. He does a batch, a weekly batch mm. distillation. So that's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So every day he makes a fresh batch and puts it into his into his system and he uses the yeast that by the time it's at the seventh day he's pretty much ready to go you know for his fermentation level so you know he's always running he's always running a a fresh batch every day so that he can get a fresh batch out every or a finished batch out every day and all that equipment maybe going to be for sale before too long from him mm -hmm. <laughs> i don't know because oh because he retired well, that's what you were implying and yeah. his son's not into it and yeah, yeah, I mean, it may already have been for sale, because this, yeah, I took these, these pictures were taken a little while ago, so I'm not sure at this point, it may, they may be gone. Yeah, and fuel is cheap, that's a good point. He actually bought this stuff, if I remember, the still he bought in North Carolina, I know that, and I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure he may have got these tanks in North Carolina, too, and came all the way down <laughs> from Pennsylvania. This is just basically a diagram of, you know, what I just explained over there. I mean, this is a big 12-inch, um, column. Now up here is what's called a def deflegmator at the top. A deflegmator is just a, a super duper condenser that, that is very efficient and it can be placed in different places within the, within the column, but in this case it's at the top. That takes the last, you know, bit of alcohol out and, uh, and that's what makes the, uh, makes the jump from say 180 proof to 192 proof or, or something in that range, the deflegmator. And, and uh, you know, that's basically, you can buy them too for any, just about any size you need. You know, they're used in, it's used a lot in vodka production and high, you know, high alcohol content production. And you know, of course, a lot of people don't realize, and I'm, I'm not a liquor maker, so I don't, I don't know, I don't understand other than talking to people who, who do it. Um, they make a, they normally make a pretty high proof product and then they just cut it. You know, they cut it um, to, down to, you know, cut it with water down to, um, down to, you know, 140 proof or 120 proof or 151 rum or whatever you want. They don't, they don't, they don't proof it. They don't manufacture a proof and then bottle it like that. It, or, or even age it and then bottle it. They, they make a lot of higher proof stuff then they cut it and do it that way. Yeah. The way they make your money is to, you know, some people will cut quite, you know, quite liberally and you, and, you, and you don't have the proof that you think you're getting, you know, we're just talking about some of the ways unscrupulous people can, but that, this, that's all beverage stuff. I mean, we, you know, we want, the, we want the most high proof we can get. That's essentially what we're doing with the bubble caps, except it's not 
they're not caps, they're just downcomers and upgoers. You see how that works? You know, they're, they're, they're both submerged. You know, that, that's coming up and then going up into the next one and that's draining down that one. So the same, system, the same operation is going on both ways. Okay, I think I better talk about that stuff now. You know, we are, we're getting pushing with time. We'll get the packing and the other design of still that I want to talk about. Okay, for most people who aren't going to spend the $190 that that one assembly costs, for most people what's going to happen is, $190 and right there you're looking at it, <laughs> we're going to go to a much simpler design, you can see in there, it's a stainless steel perforated plate. The other way to separate water from alcohol is to, that's fine, is to um, use saddle packing or some type of packing. This particular one, let me just pass it around. Uh, this particular stuff is made of ceramic. They are made out of stainless steel. They're made out of glass. They're made out of a high temperature plastic. There's a lot of different things you can make them out of. And the shapes are different. That's what they call saddle packing because it looks like a saddle. There is some that looks like uh, a barrel with slits cut in the side. Um, there's, all different, there's all different designs and, and uh, you know, the manufacturers have full explanation of what, each, what they feel each one is suited for and whatever. But you can purchase this stuff by the pound. And what we would do is then is pour, this is a four inch column, so depending on the size of the column, if you go bigger, you can change the you know, change the distance between each plate, but you're going to set a plate and then have another plate and then have another plate and in, in there we put uh, loosely pack and this is, the idea of this stuff is that it allows a maximum surface area but still allows air even when they're, even when they're packed tight like that. You're never, never going to pack them like under pressure, but even when they're like that, it's going to be like, like that in, in, the, in the actual column. There's still a, a liberal amount of air space between each of these little things so that you're actually getting an ideal flow of gases through the, through the stuff, through the packing, but you're also getting a maximum amount of surface area on the packing and the, and the surface area of that packing is what's going to strip the alcohol away. As the, as the, as the gases fly up through, the, the, wa the water's going to collect on here and it's going to drop down and, uh, and the, vape, the alcohol vapor is going to pass up through. So, yeah, that's a downcomer. So that goes, you know, that goes in there. The, um, the other part of the equation is the, this is another form of packing. You, can, you could use just this and not use that. You could use just that and not this, or you could use a combination of both, but you would pack. And this is where the experiment, experimental mind comes in because people do all sorts of stuff. Basically, you want to wind, wind this up, wind this up into a, into a loose, you know, a loose package here, not too tight, because you, again, you want to you want to keep, um, you know, want to keep a lot of you want as much surface area as you can, but you want air to flow through. If you if you do it too really really tight, it's going to be, it's going to be difficult to, um, you know, let the air go through. But it, this stuff's pretty porous, so it's not going to really be a big deal. I think this is probably about five dollars worth of stuff here. I'm not really sure. I forgot what we paid for it, but that'll go in here. Is copper? It's copper, yeah. But it's actually a purified copper. It's, it's this is what's available, and it's a really high quality thing. That's why we use it. Why it is why it is such a good copper is because it'll strip out the fusel oils and some of the bad elements in the alcohol production process for people who want to make a beverage. You know, we're not making beverages, so we don't we don't care. But it does work just as good. Uh, as far as stripping out the alcohol for us, so that's why we're that's why we're using it. I think this is in a company called Mile High Distilling in Colorado, Mile High, and they sell the uh, packing and the copper. But essentially, that's a that's a that's a much more much less expensive and more um, easy to build type of a column than the than that kind. Um, the only problem with that, as you can imagine, as I was talking before about putting through uh, liquid that has stuff in it. This, this would, would have an extremely high probability of getting clogged with, with mash. You saw what that looked like that they were the grain and everything. You can't, you can't be running, it has to be strained, you can't be running this stuff, that stuff through this, you know, through this type of a still because it doesn't, 
you know, it's just not going to let it pass. You'll be cleaning this out all the time, and you don't really want to have to do that and you know, taking it apart and cleaning it and all, all that stuff. So, you know, we're not. Uh, you have to you have to make sure it's a it's a liquid product that's been strained out of all the all the mash. All the solids have been taken out of the mash, and you're just pump pumping liquid up through it. And even with the other design, I mean, you don't want to be putting big chunks through there. You can because you can see those. You can see those. Um, you know those. Those are not big enough to, to let too big of a thing through, so you don't want that clogging up. But let me let me show you how they how they would actually assemble this in within the column. I, th I know I have a picture of that somewhere. Yeah, there's there's one. This is one of the, one of the hobby guys. He just put that coke can there to give you some scale. By using threaded rod, he can separate the uh, plates, and then that that fits tightly within the column itself. So that's a you know it's a good example of of doing it. That way, and you can get an idea of the spacing between the between the plates. That's an image how the liquid, you know, gathers. There's a weir or a dam here, up here, to let the liquid level achieve itself. And then once it overflows, um, then it goes to the next, you know, next level here. All the while, the vapor is passing up from the bottom. So that is actually a deflect the internal parts of a, one type of deflegmator. As the, as the uh, vapors are coming up through the copper tubes, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven copper tubes, the vapor goes through the tubes and water is being flooded through the, in a, in a crisscross mm -hmm. fashion th through the plates. And that's his version, uh, and again, I don't know who that is, but that's his version of, the, of, of his deflagmator. And that's another design, that's an older design, obviously, that was, that, that's a patent picture from some British publication, I think. And there's another uh, condenser, and I'll show you that. That's essentially letting your, uh, you know, you, you've, got, you've got vapors communicating with cold water without actually touching it. You know, one, there's you can either put the vapor through the copper tube or you can put the water through the copper tube and the vapor goes outside, but that's basically what we're looking at. And here I'll show you what we've got here. I just did this to sh give you an example. This is only five feet. You know, and which is fine. I mean, this is, this is for this size silo actually wouldn't be, or this size column, it wouldn't be bad. I would probably put, you know, probably make it twice as long, but I had five feet, so that's what I did. And there'd be fittings, you know, I'd, I'd solder fittings here and here, but you can pass it around. The vapors are coming up through the, through the um, column, and cold water is being introduced through the coil. And you can just see how that, you know, uh, you could make that coil a little bigger, a little physically a little bigger to fit in there. But it's just, you know, it's not, this homemade stuff is no, not rocket science. It's very, you know, very straightforward, very inexpensive. If this was steel too, I mean, 20 feet of this might only be, you know, 40 bucks. And then, uh, or not even that. And then, the, you know, this is like $7 worth of copper. So there's your parrot. The uh, hydrometer is in there, but the liquid is coming down from the condenser into this container. And that's the drain for the container that's, go, that's going to go to, to a whole, to a tank, but the liquid alcohol is going to float in the um, in this container before it drains, and the and the hydrometer will be put in there, and just you can be reading the hydrometer in real time as as the liquid you know pours out of here. You can look at the hydrometer and see where we are: 190, 188, you know, whatever. So, you know, that's the parrot. More open top fermenting. It's a beer operation. Probably a sterilized room, it looks like it, but I don't know. These guys aren't wearing suits or anything, but I'm sure it's probably a lot cleaner than most places. Uh, that's just a still, that's the Still Dragon Company. Uh, that's just an example of their, one of their see-through little, I think they call it the Little Dragon. But there's a parrot with, a, with the, you can see on the extreme left, there's a parrot with the uh, hydrometer right in it. Okay, now back here, I just picked out some of the, some of the, examples of some common crops. So as I said earlier in the class, if you remember, I said we're going to either look at, at uh, yields per ton or yields per acre. Mm -hmm. And so I picked the same crops, corn, sugar beets, rye, sweet potatoes, uh, sorghum, cane, um, artichokes, and compared them on a weight versus acre presentation. So you can see that, uh, you know, corn, corn is going to yield the most gallons per ton of corn. It's not absolutely the best on a, on a per acre basis, it's below that. Because corn is so 
uh, popular, you know, so so widespread in the alcohol production. They have done a lot of work on genetically modified corn, water use when growing corn, just everything they could possibly think of to get the most out of uh, of every of every you know uh, bushel of corn or every ton of corn or every acre of corn grown, and uh, they've really really increased um, increased the uh, you know the output um, on some of these things like like. Uh, 390 gallons per acre, um, that's even more. I mean, you can get up over 400, you know, it's not uncommon. Um, you know, the weather has to cooperate and all that. But in this process, they've also developed strains that use less water, uh, you know, to grow and just a lot of everything, you know, uh, less fertilizer, just, just everything that, that makes it, you know, makes it uh, a better product. Again, corn wouldn't be m my choice for the, for the top choice, but it's, it's, it's one of the choices. Sorghum cane is an excellent choice because it, it can be you know, grown in, in a lot of different climates and uh, it's not that difficult to process. And I think you, know, you can see here what uh, rye is not, you know, not particularly great on the acre yield, but it's, you know, it's not too bad on the, on the uh, weight yield. So it's really just a matter of studying that and seeing what, you know, what might work, work for you. North Carolina A&T, they have set aside a whole program. There's a, a, fe a, a fellow that uh, runs that and they're, they're just researching that you know, for ethanol. That's Mr. Rainey. He, he makes molasses, but he happened to be demonstrating uh, how he crushes his molasses stalks, or how he crushes his sorghum stalks to make his molasses with his mule one day in South Carolina. That went to a, I think actually, I think it was the organic grower school, or the, uh, the uh, what's the other one? You know, the, CFSA. Yeah, CFSA, yeah. Carolina Farm Stewardship. And, uh, and he happened to be there, and I, you know, we talked a little bit, and he said, yeah, sure, take a picture, and that's, you know, that's what I do. He seemed, to, he seemed to know a little bit about what I was talking about, so I, you know, I, 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 uh, he's, I think he's done, you know, he's done this for a long time. This is a machine, there's rollers in here, and it has to turn. That's a log that's uh, tied onto his mule, and his mule just walks around in circles and squishes. He's, he has a motor for it, but he was just, it was like an old-timey demonstration he was trying to show me. The only other thing left then, unless there's any, is there any questions at all? And what I know I'm sort of rushing through this last part. Is there a, what's the commercial source of fuel alcohol if we wanted to buy some? It's, it's sort of difficult to buy straight alcohol. I mean, you can buy it. I've done it. 55 gallon drums. In Asheville, you can try um, CNC Chemical, I think it is. You can, you can ask them if they can get you some. Uh, you know, there is, there are suppliers of, of uh, denatured and, and completely pure commercial alcohol if you wanted to try it in your vehicles without having to go through making it. Of course, if you wanted to buy the absolutely pure stuff, you'd have to, you'd have, to have a permit. Uh, you, can, you can buy it, it's just not as easy as it used to be. I, we used to be able to buy, um, to buy some, you know, we, we made it for, our, for the trucks for Mother Earth, but we also bought some to have in storage too, you know, so, uh, uh, and to cut to see different levels of how proof would affect the car performance and stuff like that. But um, it, basically a chemical company is, is where you'd go. You know, here's, I'll, I'll show you a little, here, I mean this, they don't sell this legally in North Carolina anymore, but that's basically uh, Everclear. It's a 200 proof liquor, you used to get it at the liquor store. It's basically a solvent, that's what I get it for, it's just to clean, certain things have to be clean in pure alcohol. Um, but it's the same, I mean it's, this is potable, drinkable alcohol that has been taxed. The reason they stopped selling it is because so, several people died drinking it Somebody just upended the bottle and th thinking it was like vodka, and uh, that was the end of that. And it happened more than once, and so they, uh, it, it happens around college campuses a lot. So they, or at least people get alcohol poisoning. So they stopped, stopped selling this like this. But you know, you can get smaller amounts like that. I think Tennessee has it, and uh, I know Georgia does not. South Carolina does not have it. Georgia may, but I, I know Tennessee does. So I mean, if you really wanted to get some, you could check the ABC. Uh, people there and see if they can if they could supply it. Okay, um, the only other thing left to talk about is engine conversions. I don't know how much you know. I'm I'm just basically looking at the clock too because I know everybody probably wants to move on. I have to talk. You know, I have to cover it. Um, is that something that people are you know? Is there a lot of questions on that? I don't, I don't want to. I'm not going to not do it. I'm just I'm just trying to gauge how depth how in depth I have to do it. Well, that's a big interest I have, yeah. and I know nothing about it. Okay. Okay. Sure. Well, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, now I've left the engine. I have an engine that I've run on alcohol. Um, I left it outside. I, I'm gonna, we're going to try to have it go. Alcohol is hygroscopic. It absorbs water. I can make 200 proof alcohol today and put it in a sealed tank. I mean, a really a brand new stainless steel sealed tank. And by, you know, next week, 
it's going to be um, there's going to be some degree of water in there. I mean, not a whole, not much at all, really, just some vapor, some uh, droplets, you know, some condensation. It just it just will pull it out of the air. Um, even in a sealed tank, it can actually pull it from what from what air is in the tank. It's going to pull it from the air, and then it'll eventually work through the walls of the tank just by, just by osmosis. You know, when gasoline and alcohol are mixed together, and it's left to sit for a long time, it coagulates, it actually absorbs enough water that it actually is, is separates out little globules of, of uh, material. It's just, it's just a water and, and gunk in there that forms this brown stuff over time, and that's what, that's what the small engine problems are. To, and to resolve that, they put, uh, you put a stabilizer in it. It's a, it's a, you can buy for $8, you can buy a 50 gallons worth of stabilizer and put that in, that'll last for probably up to six months, depending on the, how much you put in. I mean, it's the different schedules. But that will resolve the issue with the, um, with the alcohol, uh, water, gasoline problem. Um, if people use the fuel it, almost always, and I worked at Lowe's. I was, a, I was a power equipment specialist at Lowe's and liaison between John Deere and, and Lowe's Corporation and all the power equipment stuff. And you know, I you know, got the view from both ends customers and everything, and I understand when people have trouble, they say, I, you know, I, I, I uh, used this just the other day and it was working fine, and I put it in the shed, and now I, and I say, well, how, the other day, when was that? You know, if you actually dig into it a little bit, they'll pull a receipt from the job they did. Oh, I thought it was just like last week. Well, that was two months ago. You know, that, that's it. You let it sit, you let, it, you let the stuff sit, and it just sucks, it sucks moisture in from the air, especially in the summer when it's humid. And, um, and it just creates a brown, I mean, I've taken the carburetors apart, it's just a gloppy, sometimes it's separated and floating, and sometimes it's just a, a like jello in there. Um, it's not easy to clean out, or it's not worth it for a professional mechanic, you know, if you're, if you're bringing it in to get fixed to clean it, they just usually give you a new carburetor, or sell you a new carburetor. Now, you can clean it, it'll come off, but I mean, it's just takes time consuming. That's one of the issues with small engines. Automobile manufacturers have, because there's so many cars, you know, so they have, um, they have set up their internals on the cars to, to be able to tolerate the alcohol. So they're really not an issue. Uh, you don't hear as much about alcohol being uh, E10. E10 is a mixture of 90% you know, gasoline and 10% alcohol uh, being an issue with, uh, with gasoline in cars as much. I mean, that certainly your mechanic can probably give examples of, yeah, this guy had to have his fuel injectors cleaned or the tank was corroded or whatever, but that's not as common. Small engine manufacturers were warned well, I shouldn't warn, but we're notified many, many years ago that we were we were migrating towards a 10% mix, you know, and um, and they had to be prepare their equipment for. It. But then most of them just never did that. They just never did. They just they dug their feet, you know, in the ground and they just said no, and they just say it's not our fault. It's the fuel's fault. You know, you got to use the stabilizer. So they sort of d put the onus on the on the consumer to buy the stabilizer to make it right instead of, you know, instead of doing the other one. Yeah. The reason I brought up the small engine was not because of the whole fuel. Uh, bringing moisture is that they're harder to modify because most small yes. engines you can't mess with the timing on. No, the older engines you could mess with the timing, and it's basically you know if we can get that started, I will. It, we I have not modified the timing on that engine. It would have to live with what you know. It's not it's not an optimum running. It's just it's just running. On some designs you actually can get in there, and the pickup that reads the crankshaft you can move it so you can advance the timing slightly if you can if you'll have to. You know, you'll have to, it's not made to be moved, but I mean, you can, you can set it up so it can, so it can be moved. Mm -hmm. um, and the, as I said, on the older engines, that was adjustable. It had, it had, you loosened the screw and you kicked it over a little bit and locked it down again, just like a distributor in a, in a car. Newer automobiles, newer, I mean, uh, since the mid, late 70s, have, have automatic uh, detonation sensors built into their manifold so they can hear the ping and when they, and that automatically, the computer will pull the, uh, timing back a little bit until it stops pinging. When it doesn't ping, it'll pump it up until it starts pinging again. And then that you can't hear the ping, but it's it's sort of a pre-ping, but it can hear it. So you, we don't have to worry too much about about timing with the car because it's already built into the computer system. Um, the I have a flex fuel Ranger Ford, so my tank, my fuel tank is is totally stainless steel lined. Everything's perfect there. The fuel lines are all corrosion resistant. The pump is all set up. Uh, everything is made for alcohol fuel, so no issues at all. But even in regular cars, they have modified all that stuff to be able to uh, 
span over the, the number of years that you expect to be owning the car that it's not going to corrode out on you just because there's 10% alcohol in there. Because we actually were supposed to go this year, but they've deferred it. I'm not sure what, what's going to happen, but we, the 10% mix that we've been living with for the past you know, so many years is going to go up to 15, or I, I believe it, it will. We, it may not, but uh, they've been fighting to get it up. So you know, they're going to have to start thinking, because that, that RFS, that renewable fuel standard, you know, is probably going to, depending on the administration, is probably going to get uh, higher and higher going forward. Um, people complain because it reduces mileage, but, but the, as I said before, the engines are not really, the corrosion aspects of the engines are being taken care of, but the optimization in performance is not. So even though we have the fuel that's available with a really high octane, and it would be a, nice, a, a really nice thing to, to be able to use that, um, they haven't optimized the engines to, to do that. So, so what's happening is you're just going to have to live with lower, you know, with lower um, fuel economy. Did you ever hear of adding acetone to gas? Yeah, it doesn't, I would, uh, it, it doesn't um, work. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's pretty corrosive in itself. It can, it can eat up uh, a lot of stuff within the like engine. Gaskets. Yeah, gaskets and floats and carbureted cars and seals and things like that. What would you change about the engine to make it run better than alcohol? Like more torque? I w no, I would put, I mean, the, the, main, the main things is preheat the fuel, um, elevate the, the heat of the fuel so you're getting it, you're getting it uh, you know, about 170 degrees coming in, um, you know, before it gets to the actual injectors or the engine or the uh, carburetor. I would increase the compression ratio and I'd preheat the air coming into your, into your air intake. By whatever means, I mean, there's different ways of doing that. Use the exhaust of the engine, you can use electric heaters. What about the gearing you know, as far as efficiency? Does it explode slower or faster? Yeah, it's, it's flame speed is, is slower, so it, it, it's, it, doesn't, it burns cooler and it, its flame travel is slower. So then more torque? Kind of more. Yeah. Uh -huh. So what's the opposite of torque? Horsepower. Horsepower. Yeah. So you've got, well, actually, they can both increase as you go up. So, you know, as you increase, they, you can adjust the. The, the, the camshaft actually is what dictates the torque and the horsepower and stuff. So you can, you can have the cam ground or buy a cam that's ground to a certain point uh, and they'll do that you know, for you uh, if you really wanted to get into it. And that's a, that's a, you know, that's a major deal. It's expensive to, to rebuild the entire engine. Oh yeah, your question about small engines, about, about modifying them. You know, basically you're just going to live with you know, what you, you live with what you got. If you're making your own fuel and you're doing it efficiently, you know, it's not like you're putting $5 a gallon gasoline through it and so you're worried about it. But you're running that little Honda single cylinder on alcohol fuel. Yeah, and I'll, you know, honestly, that is a, that's a summer engine. I mean, I didn't, I didn't put any of the, of the heating. It's going to be very difficult to start because it's so cold out. You know, I, I should have brought it in earlier. The metal is cold. But I, I have some, uh, I started it last night. I, about this time last night I did it, and I left it out. And, you know, I had to use ether to get it started. But, you know, just to get it started. But once it's started, it will, you know, it will function. Um, you know, modifications and that are basically a jet change, and that's all, that's all it needed. You know, that's, that's fine. And I can show you, I'm not going to take that apart. No, I could, but I'm not going to do it. I'll take this one apart. So, so this is a Holley, uh, this is a Ford, a six-cylinder Ford, five-liter engine. Carter Weber, manufacturer, but it has Holley on it too. I don't know, maybe they, maybe they collaborated on it, but but this is basically a six-cylinder, 1985 Ford six-cylinder, one of the last carbureted uh, generations of, of, any, of you know, most vehicles. After that, they, they went through what they called feedback carburetors, where it was sort of computerized carburetors very briefly, and then they started to uh, go into fuel injection, and everybody uses fuel injection now. So I'm just going to take it apart to show you where, what we're going to do is take the bonnet off here, to expose the float bowl and the jets. It's called the air horn, this part. This assembly here where the air cleaner would attach. Basically what we're doing is enlarging the jets. Some carburetors don't need much, you know, I mean 20, 22 percent, some are more in the 30 percent range. It just really depends on, it's, it's a trial and error, and it's the best way I can describe it, but you, you definitely have to make the jets a little bigger because the jets that pass fuel, uh, I should put it that way, not, not the ones that pass air, because sometimes they have, they have ones that are designed to let air in too. But the, the fuel jets have to be enlarged because the alcohol fuel doesn't have the BTU content that gasoline does, and that's because it has oxygen in it. So 
so some of the BTU heat value is being replaced by the oxygens. The benefits, of course, is it burns cleaner. The downside is it, it takes more fuel to go the same distance uh, on alcohol than it would on uh, gasoline. We, we make those jets bigger because we need to introduce more, you know, physically more fuel into the, into the engine. So we have to make the hole that the fuel gets metered through bigger. And that's, you know, that's th basically it. So let me see, I think I've got it all off now. Somehow I've got a tight... You already got the gas out of it? Oh, the, yeah, this yeah. gas has been out a long time ago. Why am I not coming out? Oh, that one. That's all that is. This is the float. Okay, let me just explain a little, little quick lesson in, in uh, carburetors. The fuel comes in this hole. Fuel line would go in here, and that is uh, over here, and it drops the fuel. It drops the fuel into this bathtub here, this little this little container, and that float floats in here, and the level of that float is important because it the float has to has to be at the same level at the as the fuel is consumed when you're driving. If, if the float didn't let enough fuel in that tub, it wouldn't. Um, it would starve of fuel when you, you know, when you're going fast. If it let too much in, it's going to flood it. So that that float setting has to be within a, you know, within the proper range. So that's, you know, that's one thing we have to worry about. Alcohol being less, uh, having a different density than, than um, gasoline. We have to make a slight adjustment in the float level, of that. And the, but the main thing is this jet. And I don't know if you can see it. I'm, I'm going to have to take the, I'm going to have to take this thing off. This is a, a little more complicated carburetor than a lot of them, but it's okay. I'm exposing the, the jet here. This is a nice design. That's a metering rod. I'll talk about that in a second. The jet, the jet is in the bottom of that container is a little, it's a little golden round thing with a slot in it. In a, in a less complicated carburetor, that would be, all this stuff wouldn't be on there. It would just be a jet, it'd just be a hole. Mm -hmm. And uh, this metering rod, depending on the vacuum, depending on what, what, what level, where your gas pedal is, you know, whether you're, you're demanding speed out of it or you're just cruising or on idle, you know, uh, the vacuum changes. This will go up and down, and the little teeny bottom of that is stepped. There's a little really skinny one, and then the next is a step to the next one, and the next one. So as this lifts, as you change speed, this thing will go up and down. By removing the thickest part of this and turning it to the thinnest part, you're going to let more fuel in. Does it get that? Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so in theory, in fact, not just in theory, but in, in, in reality, you can either machine and you can do that. You can, you can machine this metering rod or purchase some, one that's smaller mm -hmm. and leave the jet alone, or you, can, drill a or you can drill a bigger hole, and it's easier to drill a bigger hole. Well. Yeah. <laughs> but, the, but the metering rod will still function uh, the way it always did, even though the hole's a little bigger. So as I said, you're going, you're going uh, about 30%, you know, I'm just roughly going to say about 30% bigger for alcohol to, uh, to function in, the, in there. But once again, not many cars are using carburetors. No, they're not. And that's why I'm going to talk about, uh, about um, fuel injection. Let me see if I can slip this back in here in a reasonable... Want light again? Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, it, might be, it may be Borg Warner, it may be one of the, one of the other automotive uh, carburetor-related manufacturers, but you can actually replace the entire carburetor assembly with, a, with a, what they call a throttle body fuel injection. Instead of all this stuff, by a fuel injector, it meters the fuel in through a fuel injector pencil, just like a real, a real, real fuel injector. So we've re replaced all this float stuff and all this complicated stuff by a fairly simple bolt-on component. The, those kits will run about 400 bucks, but you can actually, you know, you take the carburetor off, put that on, and it distributes. Once it's atomized that fuel, instead of atomizing the fuel into each individual cylinder, it atomizes it up in the manifold, and then it gets distributed just because the carburetor atomizes it up in the manifold too. You know, so it's the same thing. General Motors used these for a while, and it was very popular in, in the cheaper General Motors cars to have those throttle body injectors, because it was a good transition between having eight individual injectors or six individual injectors. They just did the one or two. You know, that one has two. So 
But I, I just wanted to bring that up because you, you can, uh, if, you, if you Google throttle body injector, you'd si see all sorts of you know, retail outlets for it. What you would do is you would, is you would uh, figure out the fuel delivery. You can get this information from the manufacturers, figure out the fuel delivery um, of a typical three liter or whatever your engine is, and then just multiply in that extra 30%, whatever, and order your throttle body injector to, to be that size. So you're, you're introdu the throttle body assembly is going to introduce approximately 30% more fuel into the, into the system. And you can do it that way. The same with these individual injectors. This is a four-cylinder engine, so you have four, four injectors. One, two, three, four. The injector is just like a, a sleeve, and there's a very sharp, durable, what they call a pintle, which there's a nozzle, and this pintle uh, is it's under extre extremely high pressure. This pintle uh, backs out for a split second, so it spits a little fuel in, and then it shuts, and it's timed. You know, so that's, that's how it works. I mean, it's, you know, it, gets, it gets opened and shut and opened and shut. So uh, there's, there's two ways of going about that. You can either order a fuel injector with a larger port, which, which they will make for, let's say you have a 2.5 liter engine and you have a, a three point, in that same family, you have a 3.2 uh, liter engine. So you just order the next size up because they'll fit, they'll fit in the same hole. So that will allow, when that thing opens, it's going to allow that much more fuel in because the bigger engine would have asked for more, you know, asked for more fuel. So, so when you replace the normal injector with the bigger injector, it's going to be set up for alcohol. The other way of going about it, which, is, which I don't recommend because I, don't, I really don't think it, they haven't developed it to work that well. It, in Brazil, they do work, but we don't have them here. Somebody reverse engineered it, I think, the ones that were sold here under various names. It, it's a computer-controlled device that, that you um, unplug the outlet signal cable on your computer for the car and you plug this box in there and then you plug the, what well, you just unplug back into, the, into this little box. And what that computerized box does, it fools the injectors into staying open longer. Mm -hmm. It tells them to stay open longer. So that, that's another way of letting more fuel in. It was called the white lightning. It was only one of several of different kinds. Uh, I, I have heard no end of problems with, uh, you know, I've talked to people who, at, you know, at, at renewable energy shows and fairs and stuff, and, um, you know, knowing, do you know anything about these people? Where, how can I get a hold of them? I spent, you know, $400. Uh, and I don't know if they still manufacture it, but, but in Brazil there is, a, there is a similar piece of equipment that apparently does work okay for people who want to make that conversion and they don't want to buy a new car. But essentially, that's another way of doing it. I, I'm sure if you were, a, a, you know, a software um, code writing whiz, you could probably re, you know, rewrite the code in your in your car, put in a new chip or whatever to tell you know tell it to stay open longer. But of course, that would be a fairly, you know, not something I don't I couldn't do. I mean, you'd have to have somebody who knew what they were doing to to, to program it. The police, you know, police vehicles and other other vehicles that need to go fast, they do have those chip, they do have those cards for them. You, you can't just go out and buy that. I mean, you have to, have to be a, uh, you know, a uh, authorized purchaser to switch your Ford Victoria cruiser in, from, a passenger, you know, from a civilian passenger car into the hot rod. So, you know, essentially that's the other, that's the other thing. So the timing, the timing is already taken care of. The mo you know, most newer, I say vehicles from the mid 70s up to now have, have automatically adjusted timing. Um, the, uh, the carburetor, the throttle body injection, or, the, or this, we already discussed that, um, that's that. And then the only other thing you can really do is preheat the air. That's fairly simple. Um, you know, just, just deliver by passing the inlet tube alongside the exhaust manifold or something along those lines. You can preheat that air coming in, so that's, gonna, that's going to uh, increase the volatility of the alcohol for you. Um, with carbureted vehicles, not so much with this stuff because the pressure, pressurized systems are, are much more efficient. But with carbureted engines, I also preheat the fuel. Uh, you, can wrap, um, you can wrap that copper, just, just like we had the copper tube, uh, wrapping the fuel, introducing the fuel line to that copper tube and then wrapping that tube around the radiator hose at some point where it's safe, you know, where you're not, you're not near the fan or, or it's going to be uh, you know, hit by anything. Um, and then out again, that'll be, you know, a few turns, really not much, a few turns is going gonna, is gonna to make it, 
you know, make it adequate to bring the temperature up to the 100, and, you know, 160, 170, something like that. Anything, anything is an improvement with a carburetor. This is a, an air preheater system on a uh, Chevrolet van, you know, the engine's in the middle on the older vans. So that's basically su uh, introducing the hot air from, the, from a point up alongside the exhaust manifold where he built a little box and he sucks the air in from that because it's hot. This company in Canada has, uh, has been at the forefront of developing wood-based alcohol fuel, wood-based ethanol, cellulosic ethanol. And they have had a lot of investment in that area. Um, I don't really know. It's still, you know, still operating as far as I know, but I'm, I'm not sure, quite sure. You know, I'm sure they're just sort of quietly selling it to fuel blenders. And then, you know, that's the end of that. They just got their investors involved and, you know, that's, they don't need to make any more. They were doing a lot, of, a lot of advertising when they needed more investment money, but I guess they've got what they need now because you hardly hear of them again. Uh -huh. Well, I don't really know how anything else as far as the, the viewing here. Um, is there any other questions? that I didn't, didn't really cover at all. So that's, yeah, I think that's it. I'm just, uh, do you want, you want me to give a shot to the engine? Not pure. It's, it's, there is some gasoline. There's probably about a little under 10 percent. Awesome.